Good evening. God bless you, and thank you for joining us. It's a privilege and a pleasure to preach the Word of God, and particularly to preach it to you. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, bring your Word again from the living page to living lives. Let your people be encouraged and strengthened and blessed in every good thing as we learn from what your word teaches. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. There are some men in the Bible, two of which have books named after them, and one who has perhaps some of the most famous scripture quoted to him that had the privilege and pleasure of being called on by God to rebuild the ancient city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was conquered many times throughout history. But this particular time was after the Babylonians had destroyed it. And finally, finally, God begins to send various men back to rebuild aspects of Jerusalem. One man, his name is Zerubbabel. He led the first group in 538 B.C., more than 90 years before Ezra. Ezra followed. He led the second group in 458 B.C. And then finally we come to a man that we're most familiar with, Nehemiah. And he led the third major group in 445 B.C. And these men would be called on by God to do what would be nearly impossible by today's standards. Perhaps one of the most famous pieces of scripture and one that you will have heard is found in Zechariah 4.4. Take your Bibles and turn to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 4. And he says, I thought, I talked, pardon me, I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And he answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. And he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? <coughs> you'll become level ground. And then he'll bring out the capstone with shouts of God bless it, God bless it. And the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation for this temple. His hands will also complete it. And then you'll know that the Lord Almighty has sent you. Who despairs of the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel, the first to go back, is charged with the building of the temple because God is going to bring back his people into Jerusalem. And before any of them come back, other than the small group that go back with Zerubbabel, God wants a temple in place. And then as the other groups come back, they're able to worship. And they remain, or he remains the center. God remains the center of their focus. The temple was very much like a Norman Rockwell picture. If you've ever seen Norman Rockwell's paintings of churches, the church is always the center of the township. 
And that's what was going on here. God called this man to go back and build it and build it, dare I say, in no time flat. But it wasn't going to be by his ability to move big stones. And by the way, when I say big stones, some of them were 60 tons. It wasn't going to be by his strength or power or his great wisdom. But it was going to be by the Spirit of God. And that's how God accomplished this. And how many times in your life have you realized that the Spirit of God has been working? Not by might. Not by human strength or endurance or power but by the spirit of the living God. And he would go back and he would, he would complete this and, 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 and people looking on would see the small beginning. Look, I, I don't see any change today. I don't see anything different. And yet, and yet little things were being done. And they were warned not to despise small beginnings. And then finally, he says, listen, there's going to come a day when he'll put the capstone on, the final stone, and people will rejoice. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, just one line, one verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. I thought to myself, well, I need the context here. When I went to the context, this is almost a line out of place. There isn't a lot of context around this. Suddenly it just jumps off the page. The one that calls you is faithful and he will do it. Not by your ability, not by your strength, not by your education, and I'm not against education, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 1, verse 1. Nehemiah 1.1, 1, 1. the word of the Lord, or pardon me, the words of Nehemiah, and by the way, his name means Jehovah comforts, Jehovah comforts, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the city of Susa. By the way, if you want to read about the city of Susa, it's in the book of Esther. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province uh, and are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before God. What we're seeing here is the situation that was brought to his attention. An overwhelming situation. Some Jews come down from Judea. That's the area that the tribe of Judah inhabited. And he spends some time with them. They speak the same language. They have the same customs. And he's living in Babylon in the city of Susa. And so he sits down with them and he's asks them, now, now Tell me, what's going on at home? What's it, what's it like? There were some that survived. There were some that, 
didn't get kicked out. There were some that remained in the land. What's going on with the remnant? By the way, God's always got a remnant that will serve him. There's always a remnant. And he said, what's, what's going on? And incidentally, there was always a remnant in the land, even into the 1900s. And the report came back, well, they're in trouble. The walls are gone. The gates are gone. There's a temple there. Praise God for Zerubbabel. And Ezra has come back with some individuals, but it's, it's not good. They're, they're open to be raided. They're open to be attacked. And the nations around them hate them. Not much has changed, incidentally. And so he say, the, the, this, this burden falls on Nehemiah. Turn with me now to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was bought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that Nehemiah was a sommelier. He was the one that would pair the wine with the food. And, and more than that, he would taste it. He would have to taste it because he would be testing for poison. He would also taste the king's food. And so this man who, as far as the word of God is concerned, has no building experience. And as far as I can tell from the word of God, no leadership qualities. Nothing to qualify him for what he's about to do. Except that he's got a passion for the things of God. He hasn't been to building school. He hasn't learned a trade. He's a sommelier. He's a wine bibber. He's a servant in the king's house who tastes the food to see if the king is being poisoned. And then on top of that, it's his job to pair one wine with the food the king is going to get. And he says, I, I hadn't been sad in the king's presence before. Obviously, it was his job to come in and smile and laugh and make the king happy and serve the food. You know, I happen to be, I happen to be somebody that really likes waiters and waitresses. I have no idea why, I just do. I find them to be interesting and delightful people and usually working their way to some great place in life. Willing to take a job that is a no thank you job on every level and working their way up. And many of the people that have served me over the years I've come across in other circumstances where they have achieved. They've got their degrees, they've got this, they've got that, and so on, and they've moved on in life. But that service was what qualified them to, co to go on. Here is Nehemiah. He's got a servant's heart. He's got the mind and the heart to serve, and he's serving the king. Interestingly, it's not the Jewish king, it's the Babylonian king, King Artaxerxes. And he would come in and he would, he would bring the wine and the food and so on. And there'd be a little smile, a little laugh, a little giggle, you know, uh, 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 perhaps the joke of the day, whatever's going around. And he was a jovial kind of individual. And everybody expected that from him. But one day he comes in before King Artaxerxes and he's got 
the most miserable look on his face you can imagine. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This could be nothing but sadness of heart, and I was very much afraid. Why would you be afraid? Many people ask me, are you doing okay? I ask people, are you all right? Nobody has any reason to be afraid. They might say yes or no, or they might lie, say yes when they really mean no, who who knows? But King Artaxerxes had life and death power. And when he turns to him and says, what's with the miserable face? He has the ability to have him replaced and killed. And so he's terrified, and rightly so. There's not a lot of law going on here. These kings had the power to thumbs up or thumbs down. Or just have you thrown in prison for frowning. And so he's very frightened. Here's how it carries on. He said, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So he's been told this news and now it just won't let him go. You know, sometimes when you're studying the word of God and something jumps at you and it just doesn't let you go. It becomes, well, it burns within your heart. And that's exactly what's happening right here. This news is burning within his heart to the point where he's willing to risk his own life. And the king said to me, what is it you want? And then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. You can just see it. Have you ever been in a scenario where you couldn't hold a prayer meeting, but inside you're holding a prayer meeting? In your heart, you're praying, oh, dear God, help me now. There are many times I've been witnessing to people and I've watched them glaze over, just glaze over. And you realize they're somewhere else. And I'd be praying inside my my head and in my heart, God, remove the blinders from their eyes that they may see. Well, here he is, he's praying, dear God, help me. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city of Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. This guy's a wine-bibber. He's a waiter. What an ask. What What an amazing ask. King, if it, if it pleases your heart, if, if I've been a good servant, if I've served you well, send me back to Jerusalem that I might rebuild the city. So we know Zerubbabel's gone back, Ezra's gone back. Now Nehemiah wants to go back and complete the walls that are in absolute destruction. But this isn't a builder. This isn't the man that has a construction job. I don't see him as being strong and robust. There's nothing in the text to indicate that. But he has a passion. He has a desire. He wants to serve God by rebuilding that city and rebuilding those walls. And though he doesn't have the skills, though he doesn't have the abilities, it's not by might, it's not by strength, it's by my power, saith the Lord. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. So I set a time. He's realizing now that the king is willing to let him go. So he said, well, it'll take me X amount of time. 
I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me with safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. Now, not only is he asking to go back, he wants letters to be sure that he's protected in his travels. Traveling was very dangerous in these days. And as he goes through the various territories, he wants to be able to show the king's letter and the king's signature, saying, I am an emissary from the king of Babylon. Don't you dare lay a hand on me. But you know, the ask doesn't stop there. I wonder how many people don't get from God because they don't ask God. The word of God says you have not because you ask not. And I wonder how many people ask too little of a God that is able to supply well beyond anything you can imagine. And he carries on and says, may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. So he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. <laughs> what did he just say? He said, well, listen, uh, if you'd let me go, first thing I'd like is a letter to get me through all the robbers and thieves and the lords and the barons in the various prefectures. I need to get through all of that so I can get all the way to Jerusalem. But then, you know, those forests that you have and <coughs> those trees, those amazing, amazing trees that you have, mm, I need that wood. His ax doesn't quit. It starts out with, I need a favor. And if I found favor in your sight, and then he begins to ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. And God gives him favor because it's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. May I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the residence to, uh, I occupy. He's even asking for timber to build his own home while he's there. And because the gracious hand of God was upon me, the king granted my requests. In other words, it wasn't his power, it wasn't his strength, it was the hand of God that was upon him. When God gives you a task, and puts it inside your heart. If you will apply yourself, God will give you favor. God will give you strength. God will give you ability beyond your natural ability. God will bring you through. He'll turn the closed doors into open doors. He'll make a way where there is no way. I've known so many people whose lives just come to a standstill because they can't see any way forward. And you need to move forward and trust God. Depend upon Him. Not in your own strength, but in His strength. And because of the gracious hand of God was upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. And the, the, the king had also sent army officers and the cavalry with me. Not only has he been given favor, not only has he been given letters to show and so on, but he's actually now being given a detachment from the cavalry and officers to oversee them, to travel with him and get him safely back to Jerusalem. When Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobah the Ammonite Officials heard about this. They were much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you want to do something for God, there's always going to be a sandbellet. There's always going to be someone to stand against you. It doesn't matter what you decide to do for the kingdom. 
somebody will point out to you how foolish you are. Who do you think you are? Well, you're nobody. But you're related to somebody. You're related to somebody. You're related to God. You've become one of his sons or one of his daughters. And he's the one that promotes you. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand and in due time. Yes, amen. When the time is right, he'll lift you up. He will promote you. In due time. In Isaiah 14, verse 24, we read this. Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord Almighty has sworn, Surely as I have planned... So it will be. As I have purposed, so it will stand. I will crush the Assyrian in my hand. On the mountains, I will trample him down. His yoke will be taken from my people and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the plan determined for the whole world. This is the hand stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord Almighty has purposed and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who could turn him back? In other words, God's word and God's way will prevail. Sometimes it's hard to see. You know, we've all just come through a portion of COVID. We're being told now that it's endemic, and that it's not going away. And... Uh, to begin with, we really had to sit down and think, how are we going to continue? We have been told we couldn't meet together. And yes, we could have gone online. Many churches went online. And for them, that was the right thing to do. But for us, it didn't feel right. And yet we wanted to adhere to the law. We had no desire to break the law. And we could see the wisdom of not all getting into the same room at the same time. And so what we did is we opened the big doors behind me. And we turned the platform around. And our people parked in their cars out in the parking lot. Amongst the garbage cans and the crows. And we preached through the snow, through the rain, through the heat, through the stench, through grief, and through everything that you can possibly imagine. But we kept on going. And God blessed us for it. And our people kept coming back. I wore a different microphone, or we had a different microphone. It was an FM microphone, and as I spoke, it was being transmitted to the cars directly to their radios. In the wintertime, people would come in, keep their car running to try and stay warm while the snow was falling. In the summertime, they'd keep their car running because of the air conditioning. And this was not our ability, our strength, our wisdom. It was done by God. God showed us what to do. All we had to do was be willing to do what he's told us to do. Well, you remember this. It's found in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. Here's God speaking to Moses. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I don't think there's anybody ever that has stepped into the platform that has been intelligent and reasonable that hasn't stepped back and said, who am I that I should do this? You see, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are weak. And maybe because of that, we tend to depend on the Lord so much more. And here's Moses saying, hey, you want to send who? 
You want to send me? Now, by the way, Moses was uniquely qualified for the job. He had been raised in Pharaoh's courts. His very name was part of the word Thutmosis. And Moses is a an Egyptian name means to be drawn out as he was drawn out of the Nile and so on. He was uniquely qualified. And yet when God said, I'm going to send you, I want you to go, this is what I want you to do, his answer to him is, what, me? Who am I that I should go? God said, I'll be with you, and this will be a sign uh, that it is I who sent you. When you have bought this people out of Egypt, You'll worship on this mountain, the mountain of God. And God, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask, what's his name? Then what shall I say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's what you say. And this is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. And God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob sent me to you. This is my name forever, and the name by which I will be remembered from generation to generation. Go and assemble the elders and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised uh, to bring you up out of the misery of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the land flowing with milk and honey, and the elders will listen to you. Even though he's uniquely qualified for the job, his mind isn't there. And God has to convince him that he's the one. Eventually, he'll say something along the lines of, but I don't speak well. I have a speech impediment. I, I, I stutter. And finally, God will say, well, look, your brother's on the way. He, he, he can speak well. I'll send him as well. And so Moses will share his position with Aaron. Because Moses, even though uniquely qualified, wasn't yet getting it. Finally, he would go back he would rally the elders of Israel and God would do one of the most or ten of the most amazing miracles you've ever heard of at the behest of Moses. You see, when God appoints and anoints, God supplies Amen. even the miracles necessary God supplies. Nehemiah was nothing more than a waiter with a burden. Nothing more than a man that served booze for a living. And yet, God made a way. And not just for him to go back, but to go back in style and even providing the building supplies, not just for the wall and for the surrounding city, but even for his own house. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Remember this. It's found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting their net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fisher of men. At once, they left their nets and followed him. These men became apostles. They were not qualified for the job. Do you know of all the apostles, there was only one that went to university? And again, 
I make no comment against education. I'm simply saying there was only one. That was Paul, who was trained on the Gamaliel. The rest were fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, average people that God appointed and anointed and carried out tremendous things through them. I think at this point I should probably say, so what's your excuse? What are you waiting for? If God has called you and appointed you, maybe what you need to do is get up and get going and do something for the kingdom of God and achieve something for the kingdom of God and stop sitting back on your excuses but move up, move out, move forward and realize if God is in it, who can stand against you? In Psalm 78, verse 70, we read this. Psalm 78, 70. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens, from tending sheep, and bought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance. Here's another man that is uniquely unqualified for the job. He took a farmer whose job it was to look after sheep and made him the most impressive king next to Jesus in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that he hadn't had some experiences while farming, looking after his sheep. He was a rancher. But does that make him qualified for kingship? And then finally, God would say of him, in spite of David's failings, and David had a lot of them, he would say, he's a man after my own heart. I tell you, God took this nobody shepherd and made him a king. And next to the Lord himself, he was the greatest king in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, we read this, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think what you were when you were called. Think about who you were before the call came along. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many influential. Not many of noble birth. In other words, God chose average people to do great things. He anointed them and appointed them, and from that came tremendous things. That's what your Bible is all about. It's all about God appointing and anointing and sending out. And then, you know, I'm never sure anymore the order of things, whether it's appointed first and anointed later or anointed first and an appointed second. Because I've seen cases of both. But God's hand is in there. And when God sets a path in front of you, walk the path. Amen. Don't sit down and say, I can't. I can't. Tell the truth. You won't. It's not I can't. It's I won't. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. 
It is because of him that you're in Christ, who has become for us the wisdom of God. That's our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it's written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God wants all of his people to be fully equipped. But let him be the equipper. Don't decide that, well, you could never be a pastor. You could never be a preacher. You could never have a word of prophecy. You could never speak in tongues. You could never do this. You could never do that. You could never do the other thing. You are weak. That's the devil. That's the voice of the enemy. You are not weak because God is in you. And if he's in you, you are more than capable. You are more than able. In Hebrews 13, it says this, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, bought back from the dead the Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. May the God of peace, who through the eternal covenant bought back Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you, equip you for every good work for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You are able because he is able. Your excuses aren't worth a hill of beans. God is able. If God has laid a Jerusalem on your heart, if he's laid a... a, a, a a task on your heart, you do it. And you do it with everything that is within you. You let nothing stand in the way. And you'll see. The Spirit of God will go ahead of you. Nehemiah asked and asked and asked and God answered. And he went to Jerusalem and he rebuilt the walls and the city was protected. God has great things in mind for you. Will you bow your heads? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these great men in the Bible that were nothing until you called them. Whose very identities are in you. And their calling became their calling card. Their success was your success. And your success made them successful. You made them great who were not great. I thank you, Father, that you are able to raise people to a level they have never been to before. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.